and welcome to the second Yoast Academy webinar. I'm Marike, the CEO of Yoast, and I'll be your host today. In this webinar, we're going to talk about one of the most notorious topics in SEO, ranking factors. What are they and how do you deal with them? And what ranking factors should you focus on? So among SEOs, there's a lot of discussion and speculation as what to actually goes on in Google's ranking algorithms. No one knows how it works exactly, but we all want to optimize for as best we can. So to help you gu guide you through this minefield, the three of us here are going to share thoughts on the matter. So I will be joined by Joost de Valk, founder of Joost, and John Noel Elderson. That's our own SEO genius. So let's take a quick look at today's program. So first, We'll explore a little background into what we mean when we talk about ranking factors. So Jono will take us through that. And then we're going to play a fun card game called, is it a ranking factor? In which we'll go through some of the usual ranking factor sus suspects. So I'm looking forward to that one because that's going to be really fun. So after that, we'll finish up with a Q&A, answering any questions you might have. So, if you do, just comment on the live stream and we'll answer as many questions as we can. So for now, over to Jono for a quick presentation to kick this webinar off. There we go. Right, so um, let's start with a bit of an introduction um, about SEO in general to set the scene. So websites, or more specifically pages, all compete to rank in Google. And Google judges the best quality and the best fit for a given search query and returns a set of results. We all know this. Managing that is essentially what SEO is all about. And there are lots of things that go into how those search results are generated and ordered. We can carve those up loosely into three processes, discovery, indexing, and ranking. Now, discovery and indexing are mostly about making sure that Google can find your content. And when they do find it, that they can read it and understand it. That mostly just requires a solid technical foundation, like WordPress and Yoast SEO, for example. So we're going to put those phases aside for today and focus on ranking. So how does Google choose which pages to rank and in which positions? How does it know which pages are the best? How does it know what best means? To understand that, we need a little bit of history. Everything started with page rank. Google measured which sites referenced other sites and which links linked to other links and to other pages and calculated the value of all of those pages. But it was a bit simplistic. So it started to also look at the content on the page or the content of the links on the pages or the content around those links. And increasingly more things like the freshness of the page or the reputation of the author who There was an algorithm that contained all of these rules and inputs and calculations. Now, nobody outside of Google knew how it worked. Sometimes Google would confirm or deny things, but in general, they don't let us know the details, because if they did, then people might cheat. SEO practitioners have spent years experimenting, trying different techniques and testing different approaches. Should they have more text or less text, bigger text, upside down text maybe? Should they put keywords in titles or should they focus on the length of the URL? Should they use alt text on their images? And throughout all of this, did their rankings go up or down? This research was accompanied by all sorts of industry surveys where people shared their findings. They would ask each other what was important and what worked. They'd say, which ranking factor do you think is most important? This one more or less important than that one. And the results of those surveys were often published and shared and gave us a lot of the general understanding that we've built our industry and collective knowledge on. We have a vague understanding of what the most important ranking factors might be. As we got a bit more sophisticated, we started to look at correlation studies. We'd say, let's analyze what the top 10 ranking pages have in common, and then compare that to other pages and try and reverse engineer things. And sure enough, many of the best pages had lots of content or lots of links. So content and links are probably a ranking factor. But what if they also use the word banana on their homepage? Is that a ranking factor? Maybe it's just a coincidence. And it's hard to know and it's hard to understand. We also spot things which correlate negatively. One common example is that high numbers of social shares don't correlate very well with high rankings. So social shares probably aren't a ranking factor, but having lots of social shares 
might make people more likely to link to your pages as more people see it and share it and enjoy it. So it's not always as simple as whether something is or isn't a ranking factor. One study famously identified that the most important ranking factor was the amount of direct traffic a site received, which would seem to imply that you could rank higher if you just bought more visits to your site, which is obviously a bit back to front, because websites which do well in search tend to also get a lot of direct traffic because they're brands that people know and trust and visit directly. Of course, there are other factors at play, things that these studies don't consider. For example, is the number of employees you have a ranking factor? Because if you have more people who can write more content that gets more links, that might correlate better than just having more content or more links. Maybe the number of employees is the ranking factor here. The challenge with this is we're trying to look from the outside in. We're trying to guess what's important just by looking at and studying the outputs of the system. We have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. We don't really know what any of the ranking factors might be, or even really how the system works. And that's getting worse. More recently, we're increasingly believing that Google is using machine learning in its decision processes to decide what content to rank. That means that even the people at Google, the engineers who built the system, don't know why a specific page or site might outrank another. There is no code or set of rules that they can look at and compare notes with and check why it's ranking. The system makes its own decisions based on its own criteria. And not only does that mean that nobody really knows what any ranking factors might be, not even the people within Google, it also means that the system may be evaluating things that we can't even comprehend or wouldn't think to check. And these things may and probably will change over time. Adding a picture of your cat, uh, your cat to your homepage, for example, might your rankings. Let's say you go up a position, but you never know if that was because you added the picture or because of what else that changed. Maybe you pushed some ads down the page. Maybe you changed the load time and speed. Maybe you just added more brown colored pixels to the screen. Maybe fewer people bounced back to the search results, or maybe the cute picture meant more people linked to your page. Perhaps it was some combination of all of these or something else entirely. And none of this is static. Let's say your competitor added a picture of a dog to their homepage at the same time, and people obviously like cats better. If your competitor's actions can affect your rankings, are they ranking factors? Some people suspect that external market factors, like the number of branded searches you have, where somebody Googles your brand name, might be a ranking factor too. And if that's the case, then, say, spending more money on TV advertising could be considered to be a ranking factor as more people see your brand, look you up, and your rankings increase. That's a long way away from how many keywords should I, should I put in my title tag or how long should my URL be. And of course, everybody's website is different. If I add a picture of a cat to my homepage, it might do nothing at all because that doesn't change, fix, or impact the areas where I'm weaker than the sites I'm competing with. This all means that it's really hard to know which specific things, which tactics, or which changes might affect your website, to the point where I don't think it makes sense for us to think about ranking factors in this way. Rather, we should be thinking about how we make improvements to our websites, which will make our pages better results for our audience than those of our competitors, because that's what Google's trying to understand. What we do know in all of this is that Google has some constraints, and it has some objectives, which give us clues as to where we should be focusing on making improvements. We know that if users are dissatisfied with the search results and they don't like the sites they see and visit, they may use other search engines. So Google has to focus on providing users with what they want. And research shows us that users prefer high-quality websites with good, well-written, specific information and content. They also prefer fast, well-designed sites, and they like businesses with good products, good services, good prices and reputations. All of these things are things that we can optimize and improve. Having lots of good links is probably better than having few or low-quality links, and all of the research we have says this is probably still the case. We know that they read to content to understand topicality and to look at relevance and quality, or whatever similar concepts they use. Most interestingly, we know that they try and experience the web like humans that they evaluate layout and content and color and shapes. So we should make sure that our sites are well-designed, fast, mobile-friendly, not overly ad-heavy, and pleasant to use. What's really interesting is we know that they monitor the behavior of people in search results. 
including when they go back and forth between different sites, or when they don't click on certain results. So we should make sure that our listings are compelling and that the first impressions our users have of our pages is positive because we know that they try and evaluate quality. So we have to be avoiding errors and bugs and poor experiences. But we also have to make sure that our products, our services and our businesses are good. If you're a restaurant, the quality of your ingredients probably isn't a ranking factor in any meaningful sense. But the reviews you get and how that influences how people interact with your brand and whether they click your search results and enjoy your website might be a ranking factor. If you have lots of bad reviews, and fewer people click on your listings in the search results, that might tell Google that perhaps they've ranked you too highly and they should reduce your rankings. It's widely believed that this kind of behavior assessment and adjustment of rankings is common. They watch what people do and they evaluate and they juggle. And we also know that if they're smart, your competitors know all of this. So they're also working to improve their sites. So you need to improve faster and to be better than they are, which also means the speed at which you improve your website might be considered to be a ranking factor of sorts. So leapfrogging your competition and staying ahead of them might mean you can create a snowball effect. We have a really good example of this. We were one of the first websites to have a really in-depth article about WordPress SEO, which was written by Yoast way back in 2008-ish. Now, because it was one of the first, and because it's been around forever and we keep it up to date periodically, it continues to get more and more links and more and more attention over time. And it answers the questions that users have when they search. Now, that's not quite the same thing as saying that the age of an article is a ranking factor or the age of a domain or how long you've been around, but it certainly correlates well. Okay, this is obviously a bit problematic. We're trying to answer what is a ranking factor and we've muddied the waters. This can be hard to understand. It feels like it's really difficult to answer the question, what is a ranking factor? Or which things are or aren't ranking factors? Because on one hand, we're saying that almost everything to do with your website might, in some respects, be a ranking factor. That Google is a black box which evaluates everything about your site, your pages, your user behavior. And your, your rankings are the product of that unknowable soup of information. On the other hand, you could interpret that as meaning, in some respects, there are no ranking factors, that there aren't any specific tactics or things which you can go away and do which will definitely directly or verifiably influence your rankings. There are any directional things like have a better website or improve your user experience, which Google evaluates in ways we can't understand. I think the reality and the most practical way to think about this and what we'll explore this evening is maybe somewhere in between. Google remains a machine with inputs and outputs. And there are definitely things which you should do which make a difference, more often than not. What works for one site might not have the same impact for another, but there are definitely things which we should all be focusing on improving in order to better meet the needs of our audiences. So, this is exciting. We're going to play a game and explore what some of those ranking factors may or may not be and try and discuss and explore and get to the bottom of how all of this might work for your site. And then we'll take some Q&A questions afterwards. So give us two minutes while we change places and get set up and get ready for a game of Is It A Ranking Factor? Thank you very much. Hello and welcome back. As Jono just said, ranking factors are problematic. But it probably becomes a lot more obvious just how problematic they are when we discuss them in a, play, in a game of is it a ranking factor? And remember, we'll end this webinar with a Q&A session. So don't hesitate to add questions in the YouTube comments so we can answer them. So let's get started. I've heard we had a small technical problem in which our audio was a bit later than we were talking. So that must have been fun, <laughs> but it's okay now. I, I see someone saying it's really okay now. So great. So let me explain the rules to this game. So you're allowed to pick a card and then if you give an interesting, a funny or a smart answer, you'll get <laughs> points. And we're not going to argue about how many points you get. <laughs> and I will, I will be the judge. In so, everything. So you're basically Google tonight. Yes. Wow. I, I am the algorithm. We need to work out what the <laughs> ranking factors are in order. This is complicated. Okay, okay. So pick a card. I'll pick a card. Let me see. 
that this is a convoluted one to start with. I've got user experience. So user experience definitely is a ranking factor, but user experience, of course, is not anything on a zero to 10 scale. So it's not something you can rate. Right. So the problematic thing with a lot of these things is that they're all both direct and indirect ranking factors because if your user experience is really, really bad, no one will ever link to you. If your user experience is really good, probably more people will link to you, talk about you, uh, talk about you to your friends, search for you again to go back to that website, all these things. So it all ties in together. Um, basically, over the years, sites with a good user experience have gotten better. Now, we'll probably at some point talk about design, but the, the funny thing I, I want to remark here is that user experience probably trumps design in a lot mm -hmm. of things. And in fact, I've worked on a couple of sites that um, were very ugly. And when we tried to make them more beautiful, people didn't really like that and left. Amazon's the great example of this. It's it's fugly. <laughs> it's not pretty. It's not like it's not not modern in its design in many regards. But its user experience is incredible. Yes. And people come back. They feel safe. It's easy. It's clean. And they do well as a result. Now their SEO is a different story. But they're a really great example of perfect, beautiful design isn't necessarily the same thing as good user experience. So three points for you. <laughs> I would have given you three points as well, but you were interrupting. <laughs> so that's only one point for you. I'll, I'll, take, it. <laughs> I'll take it. But it was a good example to have us on one. Let's, uh, let's do another much. one. Let's do another one. Let's do one from the middle. Word count. Word this is an count. interesting So the numbers one. of words you use on your blog post, I presume? Yeah, or, or in general on pages. So yes. I think this one's really interesting because there's no good answer to should I have more or less or 300 or 1,000 no, or 10,000. 350. 000. Our plugin says 350. <laughs> we should have 350. <laughs> but, but the point is you need the right amount of content for answering the question that the user has. And if that's, I want to learn everything there is to know about astronomy, that's mm -hmm. a lot of words. Mm -hmm. And they're probably of a different level than they would be if you said, how do I change a light bulb? And in some cases, actually, a really short answer is exactly what you want. We see this a lot in the recipe space, for example, where people write long, waffling stories stories about their childhood influences before they say, and here is the recipe for my, my waffles, because they think they need more words to rank. And actually, they might do much better if they were more concise. Mm -hmm. The other side is there's a whole bunch of really interesting studies that say the longer the post is, the more likely it is to get links, because it becomes a resource and something that people say, you should check this out, you should go and get more information out of it. So, so it has to be longer and more in-depth. <laughs> yes, not just longer more and words. Better. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, I, I think there's another side to this. I, um, at some point, chose to you know, put a minimum word count into Yoast SEO for a reason. And that is that I think most algorithms, and I think they're getting better at this over time, but, um, but algorithms need a bit of content mm. to be able to determine a topic. Yes. So if you have not enough content, then determining a topic becomes very hard. So the 200 word minimum that often gets cited or 300 word. I don't get hung up on the absolute amount. Yes, but people will say we can't get a green bullet if you just. So I understand why people are. Yeah, so if you use WooCommerce, for instance, and our WooCommerce SEO extension will lower it to 200 yes. because on a product page, I think it needs to be less yes. because there's a lot of other things around that that help determine topic. Mm -hmm. But it, a search engine needs, to de needs words to determine topic. It, it can't do it on it based on anything else. Yeah, and whilst whilst there's no obvious maximum and whilst more isn't necessarily better, definitely more than not enough is a good answer. Like, if you can write 500 words on a topic and that feels right, then definitely do. Don't stop at 200. I'll give you three points. Yes. And I'll give you two points because I really like the fact that he said it has to be longer and more in that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he did interrupt them. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a valid interview. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes, the rules are totally random. <laughs> okay. Yost, pick one. You want that one, right? I want yeah. that one. I love it. So, is the weather a ranking factor? We have, I, really, we, we have like a heat wave. In yeah, the so we have right a heat wave here right now, yes. which is why I'm wearing shorts. You can't see those, but you <laughs> might have seen them before the show. Um, of course, if you think about this, you'd think, no, the weather doesn't impact rankings. Um, not directly. Not directly, no. but 
if you sell air conditioning and you, and you sold it online three weeks ago when it wasn't warm, or in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands and you, or you sell it now, the difference might be that people are lo looking for different things now. They're looking for um, sh ships today or uh, delivered by tomorrow, st stuff like that. Also, if you're looking for restaurants, suddenly you might want to have a restaurant that either has outside seating or has air conditioning. So it's an outside factor. But, you it, but what you're saying is that the weather influences the way people search. Yeah, so it influences the way we, people, well, not necessarily even search, but click. Yes, or and their behavior. Uh, yes. I, uh, yeah, it, it changes their behavior, and that click behavior can dramatically impact rankings quite quickly. Yes, because of the machine learning. Algorithm. Yeah, b because of how Google works with these things. So we've seen tests. I've seen Rand do this live on stage at some point where he said, if, you, if we all search for this name yes. and click on the third result, and then that result would rank in that lo location, it would rank number one for that term for a couple of hours, and then it would fall down again. Mm -hmm. So there's a real direct impact of those things, and Google keeps denying that it's true, but well, they deny more things. Um, so the weather can influence rankings. The question is, do you can you play into it in a good way? Um, and that's probably a lot harder. I, th I think you can. There was a really interesting debate about just this topic on Twitter recently with people saying um, search rankings around Easter or um, Mother's Day um, change radically depending on the time of year. So if you're searching for Easter six months before it, you probably want to know about it and to understand what it is and when it is. If you're searching for Easter the weekend of Easter, you probably want to buy Easter eggs or your, your behavior changes. You can anticipate that and you can have that content and that relevance. Yes. You don't need to just lose because you're not the right site for that. You can understand that there are different intents and that you need to meet all of those at different times. I still think <clears throat> that a ranking factor is a really vague term and that user behavior is intertwined. Yeah. So the scientist in me wants to make like a clean mechanism out of it. I will, I will look into that later. Can't do that right now. <laughs> for, two, for now, I liked your answer, but it was also a bit vague and it made me wonder a lot of things. So two points for you. You were very polite. <laughs> you didn't Thank you. interrupt, so you so, get two points as well. So he gets points for being English. <laughs> I'll take them. <laughs> yes. Well, that's the first time ever in Europe. Well, he's he's a bit sad because yeah, of he's, he's, he's next. Yeah. Yes, he's next. Okay, let's, let's go for one of these. Stands. There's lots of these, aren't there? We're going to do all of them. I don't know. You yeah. you made them up. This is this is the one I got when we did a little dry run earlier. Oh. Bold text. Oh right, I love <laughs> which that. Which I really like. Which is I was at at this. No, well, no, I heard people got advice to make some parts of their text bold in order to rank better. And um, so it's the ranking factor. Well, does, does why, do, why don't you do this one? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I can participate. Okay. Um, so I think once upon a time, somebody thought it was. And large numbers of pages on the web, which are written by people who think they're doing good SEO, will put all of their keywords they want to rank for in bold because they think Google will recognize that I've bolded this and therefore it's important. I don't think Google is that stupid. And it, even if it may have worked once, it certainly doesn't now. I think what's really interesting is a lot of people are still doing it. Yeah. And maybe the kinds of people who are still doing that aren't paying a lot of in, um, attention to the quality of their text, aren't staying up to date with modern practices, and maybe actually it correlates quite badly as being a bad ranking factor. Yeah. Like if, you've, if you're bolding your keywords instead of thinking about how do I make this really good and readable, you're probably making things worse. I, the question is, though, if you look at this from a search engine perspective, there's a lot of copy out there on the web that's relatively old. Um, and every bit of that that uses bold might actually be pretty good. Mm. So in a lot of cases where people go, yeah, this must be a ranking factor, I go like, no, it's too tiny. It, it can't really influence like the the difference between page A and B, because that's what we're talking about, right? For it to be a ranking factor, yep. it has to be something that differentiates page A from page B and therefore is ranked higher. Yep. A word being bold in a text <laughs> is simply too small a thing well, 
to to be the difference. I agree. So I don't think it's a rank factor either. But using bold and italic the right way will help a reader understand the text. Yeah, so that's why I don't think it's negatively correlated. Not that, that depends. If you use it the wrong way, it will not help a reader understand your text. I, I agree with that. So you should use too. it the yeah. way you used in a newspaper. You'll have bold and italics in a newspaper because it helps people to grasp the idea of your text. So that's So it comes one. back to user experience. Yes. Three points for you. Two points for you and four for me. <laughs> because I thought... Drew it all together. <laughs> yes. I wrapped it up. This is the best game. Yes, I know. It, You're not it, winning, it, though. It's, not yet. Not yet. It's, also, it's also very googly in that she gives herself more points than everyone yes. else. <laughs> yeah. So, bounce rate. It says user signals, but bounce rate particularly. I... I actually think that bounce rate is a, a resultant of that other thing that we talked about. I do too, but it's a very measurable thing. Yeah, so it's one of the resultants of good user experience. Yes. So bounce rate is often misunderstood. So let me because there's two different things here that matter. One is people searching, clicking on your website going back to the search results and clicking on the next result because they didn't find the result. So it's mm -hmm. bounced back to SERPs. Which is pogo sticking. Yeah. yeah. And all sorts of terms have been used for that in, in SEO over the, over the last decade or so. I think that is a really important thing to look at. And it's one of the main reasons why I hated Google for taking away our mm. uh, keyword um, statistics in Google Analytics and, and other analytics That's programs. That's been ages. Yeah, but... The, so the, stop the, whining about it. Yeah. <laughs> Lose points. Yeah. <laughs> Lose points, yeah. Well, the, the, the problem was that at that point we lost the ability to see, like, um, are we doing badly for all the keywords that this page yes. ranks for, or are we doing badly for a subset of the people that are coming to this page? Um, so that is bounce back to SERPs. But bounce rate in general also, if people come to your site and, and, and more people than average, and average is a very hard to define number here, um, immediately click away because of whatever it is you have on your site, whether that yeah. is a pop-up or you have a horrible design or you have the image of your founder on the top of every page and you think that's beautiful but people actually get scared by it. Or I mean, there's all sorts of reasons that your site could have a high bounce rate. Fixing that will always help you. So there's a lot of these things that will help you if you fix them, regardless of whether they actually impact your Google rankings. Mm -hmm. Whether you use more bold text or not is not going to help you. Fixing your user experience, fixing your bounce rate by genuinely improving your site is really going to help you, regardless of whether your rankings get better. So that's something to focus on. Mm -hmm. And it's a good metric to look at and to see, not to compare yourself with others, because I find that fairly useless but to compare yourself with yourself, so your own pages. If some of your pages are doing very badly versus other pages on your site, then you need to look at those and look at, OK, so why is this bad? And put a picture of your cat on it. Obviously. I think you need to do that with a lot of care and context, though. There are scenarios where bounce rate is fine. Yeah. If we have a really great article or a blog post that answers the question the user had, or they come and read it every week and then go away, that's not a bad experience. That's that's exactly what we want to happen. Mm -hmm. So it's not, not precisely about bounce rate. It's about if you have pages that aren't giving the users what they want. And bounce rate might be one way you measure that, but there are certainly others. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the thing you really want to improve. As you say, you fix that, and then more people convert, more people buy. If you're scaring people or annoying them or confusing them, that's that's the thing you need to fix. It's actually the thing that I've... Um, my biggest learning for this year was something that I had to give uh, our good friend Els Arts from AG Consult, uh, who's, who put some tests on our site, asking people, what are you looking for when you're on this page? And the feedback that we got from those simple questionnaires, and this is not new. I mean, we've been doing this for ages. That's terrible. <laughs> but it, it, well, it's, it's good to see. It's sometimes terrible to read, yeah. but it's very good feedback to yeah, get. Ask people. Yeah. <laughs> so do research. OK, I'll give you two points because you started whining about 
that was most SEOs weren't even born. <laughs> <laughs> so That's two fair. points. Um, I thought you were really short. Yes, I did. Ten yes. Yeah, no, not ten. <laughs> Do support. No, no I just said two. But I did think. Oh, we only have five minutes left. Oh, oh quick, gosh. quick, quick. Yeah, too quick. much ramble. Is it my turn? It's my turn. You, you hinting I should take that one? No, 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 no. no, no I, I don't take know. a random one. I don't yes. know. Oh, this is my favourite. Yes. Sight speed. Sight speed. <laughs> um, you know so much about that. Oh, hopefully. Um, so this this definitely is a ranking factor. Yeah. Google have confirmed in various blog posts and documentation that your sight speed affects its ranking position. Now. They do say that's only the case when you are very, very slow or when you're when other people around you are very, very slow, so only a tiny percentage. But site speed is a huge part of user experience. experience. And all the research says that people prefer fast websites. Yes. They prefer things to load quickly, for it to be sleek, for it to be fluid. So even if even if site speed isn't a huge ranking factor, the experience users have of your site speed absolutely is. It means they're more likely to read, less likely to bounce, more likely to link, et cetera, et cetera. It's, under, it's a huge part of user experience. So this is a definite yes. Well, it's also something that really improves everything regardless of whether it improves your rankings. Mm. There's some great Amazon research and other research that Amazon's research on it is spectacularly scary because they say that they gain, like, for every 0.1 seconds that they make their site faster, they gain 0.1% in conversion, which is incredible if it's true. Now, that might be true for them and not for <laughs> you, but um, it's, it's a relatively relatively because it can be very hard but it's a relatively simple thing to make better um and with that improve your overall mm. site performance now i'm gonna go out on a limp and make some people in the hosting industry happy this is one of the reasons why paying five dollars a month for your hosting account is probably a bad idea yeah so you should, if you take you your websites more. yeah yeah you should have better hosting and yeah. and 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 it's it's one of those simple things where just spending a bit more money can actually help. Whereas a lot of other things in <clears throat> SEO is is actually putting the work in, putting the effort in. This is actually something where spending a bit more money and and making your site faster because with that money can help a lot. Yes. Great. I really like your answer because you connected site speed to user experience. I find that very eloquent. There's a theme there, isn't there? <laughs> yes, and, and you didn't so very nicely. So four points for that. <laughs> record breaking. <laughs> record breaking, I know. Um, I didn't feel you had that much to add this time. <laughs> so I'm giving you three points. Do we have time for the final one? Yes. Last one. Chiffon says it's okay. So you can have your final. I can pick. have my final pick. Yeah, you can have, do whatever. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know either. Pick one. Ooh. What's that? The meta description. Oh, that's a good one. It's also a very hard one to answer well. So a meta description is the thing that, if you're lucky, ends up in the search results yes. underneath the title of your site. Yeah. Um, the problem is with the if you're lucky, because in a lot of cases, Google will show something else. Um, therefore, changing it might not actually directly impact what's shown there. If it's shown there and it's good, it might influence this, the click-through rate from the SERPs to your website. So it might influence the, the number of people reaching your site. Therefore, it might actually help your rankings overall, etc. Um, now, the question is, does a method, having a meta description by itself make you rank better? And I don't know whether we can answer that with a yes or no. Google says it's a no if you ask them, but well, they do that for more things. All of the correlation research we see recently says it's a tiny yes. But it could be a yes because of click-through rates. It could be a yes because of people actually spending more yep. more time on that page. Yes. You've thought about it, you've put the yeah. work in. Yes, yeah. because if you write a good so, meta description, it's like the message. All, of all the, yeah, so all that research is always very hard to, to, to go through and actually, like, if a page has a meta description, it's ob obviously been thought about in context of SEO more than if it ha has not. So just that might have already changed its, rank its ranking. So it's very hard to say whether it actually helps, yes or no. This was really smart. Lots of points coming up. 
But I want to give Jono a final chance to add to get, something. To get five points. Um, <laughs> I think, to, just to, to echo that, I think um, it almost doesn't matter if it is or isn't a ranking factor, as with so much of this, because if you've put the effort in to, to, to make a promise to your users, that's essentially what this is. You're, you're pitching the value of clicking on that page. And if you've not done that, then how much, how good is your content? If you can't summarize it and say, you really ought to click this one because it precisely meets your needs and answers your question, then it's probably not as good as the other search results. The flip side of that is over-promising can be really dangerous. If you say, this is full of incredible cats and we have the cheapest product and the best offer, and you disappoint your users because you've made them a promise and you've broken it, that's going to harm your ranking. So it could be a negative ranking factor if you do a bad job of it. It's an interesting one. That was really smart. But you started out with questioning whether or not we should even talk about ranking factors. That's Darn a bad it. thing. It's the big, it's the ranking factor yep. show. So you should Don't do challenge that. the thing. Yep. So Joost gets three points, Jono gets one point. And now we need to know who won this game. Yeah. Oh, oh the uh, scores are being counting, tied. He's counting, he's <laughs> counting. It's very exciting. So. Joost got 17 points, and Jono got 16. Oh, close enough. Well done. Oh. But he's a what, bit older. Well done on her side, too. <laughs> I didn't know who won. So we're going to the Q&A now. Yeah, I've got and lots Joost of got questions. got some questions. Yeah, and cool. a lot of good ones. So we're going to go through a couple and see how many we can do. Um, is being a PWA a ranking factor? And you... you Please introduce the term PWA first, because so, yeah, really. this is deep. So, um, once upon a time, you had websites and you had apps, mm -hmm. and they were very different things that existed entirely separately. Mm -hmm. Now they're coming together a bit, and there's this new technology and a new approach, progressive web apps, yes. where you kind of make something that's a bit of both, and you turn your website into something like an app. Now, I think the same answer as everything else applies. If you do it well and you take advantage of the technology, maybe that will affect your rankings. Is it a ranking factor? What you can definitely do is things like more eligibility for rich search results, where you get big answer boxes and app-like functionality integrated into the search results. You might get the ability to um, book your restaurant directly from the search results, which might mean more people have a good experience, which gets you more good reviews, which makes you rank higher, maybe. I don't know. It's a it's a technological platform. It's not a thing that ranks you better or not, but it unlocks capabilities for sure. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add? No, I, I agree. It's, it's also determining whether something is a ranking factor is always hard. The question is also whether we need to say yes, yes or no to that and whether that is the reason to build a PWA or not. If you have a good use case to build a, a progressive web app, build it. Yes. I think if I had to bet on the future of the web, I would say that PWAs will eat more and more of the app marketplace. Yes. And if your business wants to be in that space and wants to beat the rest of your competitors there, it's a good investment, but not because it's a ranking factor. No. Right, because it's <coughs> a good user experience. Yes. yes. So uh, this one's interesting by Raymond. Do you think Google can actually determine quality of writing? <laughs> well... <laughs> I think Google can read text because we now see that they are able to catch related entities. They, they know stuff. So as my son, when he was in second grade or something, he learned about transition words. So words like thus and however, and stuff like that. They help a reader to understand the text. Google knows this too. It, uh, Google will have hired some some linguists we even have. So, so, so they know how language works. They're able to translate from Dutch to English, not very well, but they are able to do that. So I do think that Google knows what quality text is, and they know that people are able to, what, have 20 words in their, in their short-term memory, so longer sentences will be hard to read. That's a bad user experience. So I think they are taking that into account. I don't know for sure, but no. they are able well, to Raymond do that. has a, a nice add-on thing to that. Or are people just enjoying the higher quality content more no. and sending more good <laughs> user signals? Maybe. That could be. Does it matter? Da, uh, yeah. That's the, the good question here is, does it matter? I have one thing to add, though, which is um, what you say about long sentences. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we've learned in, in our own research here with our linguistic team is that it's very hard to, uh, to get the content and the topic out of a text if the text is poorly written. Mm -hmm. 
So if the text is more eloquent and, and, and uses more fancy words, it might actually be harder to figure out what the text is about. So um, I think that good, readable, understandable text has a higher chance of actually getting Google to uh, understand what it's about. Yeah. Um, now, to be fair, the, the Guardian ranks quite nicely, and the Guardian doesn't score very well in our in most of our readability tests. So it, it, this is all. But they get a lot of direct traffic. They do get a lot of direct traffic. <laughs> Absolutely true. Um, so another question. It, yes. It's too bad we can't get points for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go to uh, that, that one's. A bit, a bit boring. Having um, a, <laughs> yeah, I, I won't say which one it is because no. I don't want to annoy anyone. Um, Christopher asks, does CSS styling affect ranking or the visual layout of the page? Yeah. So I, I touched on this briefly um, in my thing earlier, saying um, they try to understand pages like humans do. And it's a bit oversimplistic. But there are a whole bunch of patents they have. And one, the most famous one is called Reasonable Surfer, where they try and look at the layout of the page. And very simply, they know that a link in the footer is probably less relevant than a link in the header. And they definitely go further than that. We know they render the page. We know they process and parcel the CSS. We know that broken layouts and hiding things definitely impact things. So they are definitely looking at the design and how that manifests in their system, who knows. But yeah, they definitely look, your CSS impacts your, your rankings. So if you have an ugly shade of pink as the background for your page, or all your stuff is moving, or half of it's invisible, that's definitely an issue. Pink is never ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Pink is a wrecking factor. Yeah. Um, Yarno asks, do you think there's any value in publishing structured data beyond what's specified in Google's guidelines and for social media shares? Oh. Yeah, I, I that, I think that is a very good question. Um, I have to say, we're going to talk about schema more in our next webinar, yes. I think. Yeah, come back for that one. because so, yeah. so there's a lot of things, but I wanted to tease that a bit. Um, I think there is. Let me say that. And then we'll give you the more expanded version of that in our next webinar. Um, now, something completely unrelated to what we're talking to, but I just want to touch on it. Should we still be using the classic editor in WordPress or the new blocks with schema? <laughs> I love that this, this question comes up regardless of where we are, what we talk about. Everyone asks this. So for, for <laughs> SEO reasons, it really doesn't matter, except you can't use our schema blocks. You can't use our new schema blocks like yeah. how to and FAQ, no. etc. Yeah. So if you if you want to use those, then you by all, uh, yeah, you really should be using the new one. Um, if you don't have a use case for any of those specific ones, and that's how to FAQ, but that's you, for now. For now. Yes. Um, then there's no real difference. So I think the the bigger picture that it's worth looking at as as things move forward is you've got to compete against other websites and other pages. And if they're using Gutenberg and similar tools and they are crafting the layout and they're taking advantage of all these toys and they're really thinking about more than just the text, they're not writing a page, they are authoring a, an article, you've, you've got to do the same thing. You've, it's not just enough to write good text. You've yes. got to present something for the user. I think I think in, in the future, Gutenberg would be the best way to go. Yeah. Yep. But it's yeah. not entirely but there yet. Give, give it some <laughs> time close. to become more usable yeah. if yes. you're annoyed by it. Um, I like this one. Is having multiple languages a, a ranking factor? If your site presents products in more than one language, is that a positive factor? Well, Google only speaks English. So no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an American company, which makes me wonder. If it's true. But you know more about that. So I, um, I don't think it's necessarily a, a ranking factor. I do think that if you um, do all the technical stuff around multilingual SEO well, and you have a page ranking well in English, and you have a page in Spanish, then the fact that you have an English page that href ranks correctly to that Spanish page might be helping that Spanish page. So in that case, it's not the fact that you have multiple languages, but it's the fact that you have multiple places in which you can rank. Mm. And, and gather links and everything else. So I think that um, works in a way. Um, I don't it's also think... a good user experience. For people who don't aren't, aren't native English, a translation of your website could be 
It Just, could, yeah. So yeah, it could be very good. Yeah. I, there's a lot of um, work that I've I've done myself like a decade ago in the U.S. with some uh, mobile phone companies that only had an English version of their site. And making a Spanish version of their site skyrocketed yeah. their sales in, in specific yeah. cities. Yeah, so, for... so not being native means that it's harder for you to read a text, even if you understand it. I don't know if you know this, John. <laughs> for us Dutch people, the English is, an, uh, is a challenge. It's, yeah. a, it's a messy language. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know, you only talk English and HTML. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, I'm sorry, too. He talks schema, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Which is good because that actually defines things a lot better than all these other languages. Do. Um, John, we've talked about user experience a lot, and one of the first questions that came in is, how is user experience actually determined by Google? Which is really interesting because they're not on your site measuring your site, are they? So there's there's a lot of conspiracy theories that maybe they read your Google Analytics and maybe they're looking in Chrome. Maybe some of that is true. It's probably not. So what they are looking at is when they crawl your website, they're looking at the content, the structure, the speed, the layout, the color scheme, what shade of pink you use. But they're also looking for those really critical short clicks and bounce backs and pogo sticking. And do people visit five other websites when they visit this one? Because they're definitely analyzing their own search results. So it's a combination of all of that. I think they're trying to get smarter with it and they're trying to understand how people experience these sites. But yeah, it's really, really hard for them to quantify because they're not there. Right. They're trying to work it out from the outside in. It's funny, another question that ties into this. With respect to bounce rates, I often search and open multiple uh, search result links in new tabs. How would that affect bounce rate from Google's point of view? Because even though I bounce, I don't bounce back to Google. Well, A, Google has measured every one of those clicks so it measures if you click four times, and it, then it counts all four of them as clicks to individual websites. If you then don't bounce back to uh, Google and um, and stay there on one of those four, then it knows that at least one of those four actually answered your question. It has enough data for most search results that it can just do the, the analysis on that and make it very simple. Google has more data than you realize. <laughs> yeah, you're not scaring me. <laughs> Well, it has it has the click data on every search result on uh, and and the not click data yeah. as well, yeah. which is really powerful. Which is uh, 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 because for a so lot of searches, point. there's also a, a lot of there's also a lot of no click searches where people either already found the result in a rich snippet or refined their search. Mm. And those search refinements are something that Google uses aggressively as well in all sorts of other things. So. Bounce rate and all these things are very iffy topics. There's something worth dwelling on there, which is that the mental model we all have that somebody searches something and then clicks on a result isn't how people behave. They search, they change their search, they search again, they click on five different results, and they see all these different brands and all these different pages. And it's that experience that decides whether they bounce, how they feel about the experience. That's how we need to be thinking about search and optimizing. It's not just, did they bounce from my site? It's what was their experience and what role did I play in it? Yeah, when I think how I search, I go to a site, bounce back, go to a site, bounce <laughs> back again. I, I often come yeah. there and then, 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 then quickly compare some things and then choose one. Yeah. But then I've bounced like four times. Yeah, and, and those sites will change, maybe at scale, change rankings as a result. So someone asks, or rather remarks, how can you talk about ranking factors without talking about links? Ah, we didn't talk about that. It was in here, <laughs> but we didn't uh, draw so, that one. So honestly, links are probably the most boring topic in SEO. Um, they're also very, very, very important yes. in uh, uh, lots of different results. Now, I still feel that links are the result of other stuff you do. So if you do PR well, if you do uh, your marketing well, if you do a lot of these things, uh, then you get links as a result. At Yoast, we've never done any real link building. We've gotten our links because we wrote good content or we wrote good good stuff. Or we made friends. Or people were friends with us and wanted to link to yes. us. But all of that is relevant, but we didn't really do active outreach in no, LinkedIn. We didn't do it planned. No. But, so we did outreach. We just, just didn't make plan. No, but that, I think that is an important thing. I think that the age in which going out and getting links in the artificial way worked is behind us. 
in English and maybe in a few other languages. Unfortunately, in other languages, like in Dutch, getting a shit ton of spammy links still works. Um, when the other sites aren't very good. Yes. When, the, when you have really good competition, if you uh, at that point it becomes impossible to rank against them. But yeah, so it's um, we didn't talk about it that much because it's a hard topic as well. We can do a show on links at some point. That would actually be a good idea. We have, we have time for one question. You can answer. You can finish okay. your sentence. There's there's one really interesting thing I think in the world of links at the moment is there's some really interesting research um, by a guy called Tom Kapper from Distilled. Um, asking about what role um, what role links have in ranking factors moving forwards, and his theory, and there's a lot of really interesting research behind it, is that to get into Google and to get into maybe the top 30 or 20 rankings, you need links because they need to find your site, and you need other sites to have had said yes, this is a thing, which is why they're linked to it. When you get into the top 20, 20 or 10. It's not about links anymore. It's about those user signals, the bounce backs, the engagement, the quality. So maybe links are table stakes to compete, but then beyond that, it's I do you have good user experience? Are you worth this ranking? Are you yeah. showing that you're valuable? That sounds interesting. Maybe you can invite that guy. We well, should. should. Do, you, do you know him? I, well, I don't. Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll we'll look at that separately. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask. Yeah. Okay. Hey, the, the, final question. The, I I really like this one. Can removing pages that get low click through rate <laughs> help overall site SEO by improving the average click through rate? I think that's a lot of words in one sentence that don't necessarily belong together. But removing low quality pages from your site is overall usually a good idea. What? Or improving them. But always redirect them. But redirect them. Yes. No, do something useful with them. Yes. Um, so in, in the time of the Panda update, mm. there was this so called fix for Panda which SEOs called the Panda Diet, um, which was basically to remove uh, a lot of low quality pages from your site or remove them from the index by no indexing them or robot sexting them. And that helped a lot of huge sites. And this got the idea to smaller sites that it might be a good idea for them as well. I don't think it works as well if you only have 50 pages. Hmm. No, I don't think so either. But um, I think the overall idea of removing stuff that's not good and keeping the stuff that's really good would help us all. So if everyone just did that, the web would get better, your website would get better. I think that's a good idea. There is an interesting question behind that, which is why do you have a website that has low quality thin pages? And can you identify what causes that and how you avoid is it? Is it technical problems that spit out duplicates? Or is it that your blog team don't don't aren't trained well enough or don't understand. There, there are many reasons that cause those, but maybe you should try and address that as well rather than just tidying up afterwards, and then you can really win. Right. So we're going to wrap up. Oh. Yes. Sad, right? Yeah. <laughs> so what have we learned about ranking factors so much? So when Google was much simpler. It was easy to spot specific tactics or patterns which you could use to get ahead of the competition. You could tweak your page titles or put some more links and maybe get hacked. Maybe you even had some tricks when you're, which your competitors didn't know yet. But as Google became increasingly more sophisticated, that's just not how it works anymore. The secret is to focus less on all those individual tactics and focus more on providing the best results for your users. So Google really doesn't want site owners to be trying to reverse engineer how they rank sites and to focus on tweeting those individual things. They want better content. They want better results for their users. That makes it harder to know what will have impact and what not. But it also means that you'll almost always benefit from improving your content. So it's always worth improving your understanding of your audience and making sure you're solving their problems. It looks like Google will, at least for the foreseeable future, still reward sites which get greater numbers of earned links from relative, relevant authoritative sources. That means it's worth producing content and resources which people will want to read and tell their friends about. 
And we don't want to say that ranking factors don't exist. <laughs> they do exist. They're real. But we are saying that if you're focusing on which ranking factors you should be optimizing for, you're, you're probably missing the big picture. And that leaves you vulnerable for Google's updates when they catch you out. And to the competitors who do the hard work to deserve uh, to, to deserve to outrank you. So the secret, and that's very boring, <laughs> is to do the hard work. The ranking factor you need to care about is the overall quality of your website and of every one of your pages. And there's no faking that. You just have to be the best result for each phrase you want to be found for. So getting all of that right requires a lot of hard work and a lot of time and a holistic approach to SEO. So thank you so much, Jono and Joost, for being here, the winner of the game. Great. <laughs> and thank you so much for watching and for asking those awesome questions. So that's it for today. If you want to find out more about SEO, be sure to check out Joost Academy. We have a free course for beginners and free trials for all the other courses. So there's something there for everyone. And the next webinar, we already talked about it, will take place on September 5th. We'll be bringing in an expert from outside of Yoast. Mm -hmm. Yes, the wonderful Jason Barnard. And we'll be talking about ways you can make it easier for Google to understand your website and your content. Structured data, semantic markup, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> so we're really looking forward to that. So for now, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.